Hey, it's Jim, and this is level one of the CFA program, the topic on financial statement analysis and the learning module on analysis of long-term assets. Note that the Institute has another learning module called Analyzing Balance Sheets. And if you watch that recording, you might remember that a large portion of that learning module was on intangible assets, in particular, goodwill. Here in this learning module, you would think that that conversation would be extended to include all long-term assets, intangible and physical assets. But boy, going through this reading, it looks to me like there's about 75% of this module is on intangible assets. There are a couple of really good problems inside of the module on uh, the discussion of physical long-term assets. And those are probably helpful for you to look over. But the focus here is on intangible assets. So I did a little bit of research before uh, making this recording, as I always do. And I went to the Sony financial statements and looked at their 2022 uh, balance sheet. And in that financial statement, they report 450 billion yen worth of intangible assets, which depending on exchange rates is, what is that? four or five billion US dollars. The reason I bring this up is because as many of you who watch my recordings know, I'm a huge rock and roll fan and a huge Beatles fan. And back when I was in college, uh, Michael Jackson bought the Beatles catalog or at least a large portion of the Beatles catalog and he had ownership and rights to that. So that sounds an awful lot like an intangible asset. Then over the years, I think he sold part of it to a company called ATV and then that ATV merged with Sony or Sony took over that company. So I was thinking of that four or five billion of intangible assets that Sony reports on its financial statement, how much of that is attributed to uh, John, Paul, George, and Ringo, I don't really have a good answer to that, but I think it's helpful if you can think of an intangible asset that, you know, it's kind of exciting rather than the dull, like the dull formula for Johnson's baby shampoo or something like that. You know, so look at this. First LOS, intangible assets. Second LOS, intangible assets. Third LOS, intangible assets. So pretty much the focus is going to be on uh, how we handle all of the intangible assets, including patents and copyrights and, and goodwill. So let's go ahead and start out with uh, how does a business obtain this intangible assets? So look down in that middle column, we have three blocks for you. So orange, purchased in situations. And then I want you to skip down to the bottom, acquired in a business combination. So that orange thing, that would be, that would be Michael Jackson buying the, uh, the Beatles catalog. Down to the bottom, acquired in a business combination, that would be Sony acquiring ATV. And so look at the international and the gap standards and requirements over there, they're, they're identical. Um, fair, valuable, eligible for capitalization uh, under both the international and the US standards for both of those things. Where it gets interesting is in the middle, developed internally. So I want you to envision uh, going back into a time machine. And if you, could, if you could sit into the recording studio when George Harrison was writing that great song, The Tax Man, Think about this, develop internally this intern, intangible asset where well, you have the guitar, right? And you have the, you have the drums and you have all the equipment and you have uh, technology and you have air conditioning and lighting. I guess you can lump all that stuff in there as a, as a research expenditure. And so notice those things are going to be expensed. Okay, now that's under both the international standard and the US standard. However, there's a difference in how we handle the development costs. Under the international standards, um, they're almost always going to be expensed, but under certain circumstances, they can be capitalized. But under the US system, remember that both research and development costs uh, are going to be expensed as they are incurred. Now, I don't know enough about the making of music of what would be, what would be a research expenditure for the Beatles and George Harrison, and what would be a developmental expenditure or developmental cost for George Harrison and the Beatles. But some really smart people out there would know that. 
I can't imagine there would be any confusion on the exam. Now, one extra item of note is, look at the bottom there, that arrow point under developed internally. Software development, those costs are going to be expensed before technological feasibility is established. You know, whatever that means. So I think the Institute will probably give you a clear statement if it asks you this question on the exam, and then they'll be capitalized after that. So remember, remember, uh, Michael Jackson and Sony at the top and the bottom, those are treated the same way, right? But then inside, think of George Harrison writing that song, and then you just have to remember those differences there. Now, I'm not sure that Sony would ever be faced, well, I, sh I shouldn't say ever, but clearly in the near future, Sony is probably not going to be faced with impairment or de-recognition of the value of that Beatles catalog, because as we know, those songs, they just get better and better as, uh, as we get older, at least in my mind, but probably lots of other people's mind. But there are, there are intangible assets that have to be adjusted based on their value on the balance sheet. So we call that impairment when that value is reduced. I mean, let's think of some crazy example. You know, maybe somebody comes along and says, oh, the Beatles, they stink. And then that carries on and carries on. And then we all take our Beatles records and we throw them on, uh, on a football stadium or a baseball stadium. You guys are too young to know. Do a quick research. In the late 70s, there was this backlash against disco and there was a baseball game where people brought their disco albums and they threw it onto the field. I can't remember if somebody stomped on them or if they burned them or whatever it was. But I know that I cried when they burned the Saturday Night Fever record on, uh, on national television. And then, of course, if the impairment is so severe, then we just need to remove the asset from uh, the income statement because it no longer has the potential to generate any revenues over on the income statement. So here's a good, uh, a good slide for these impairment effects. What happens on the balance sheet? Of course, of course, total assets decrease. This probably then is going to affect the right-hand side of the balance sheet, uh, which will ultimately result in a decline in equity. Now, if we have these impairment losses that accumulate over time, they must be presented separately. Over on the income statement, we get this impairment loss or an impairment expense. So that increases expenses, reduces net income for the period. And then on the cash flow statement, it doesn't show up anywhere. Derecognition effects, these are pretty much the same, but they're, they're, they're more dramatic. And the simple fact that what we need to do over uh, on the income statement is recognize that entire loss, which will you know, have a tremendous impact on net income, but then depending on how we get rid of the asset, you know, what we can do is we can sell it. I mean, you know, if we have, if we have this asset that no one's really buying the product lines, but it, the, still the asset can be retooled to make something else, maybe we can sell it for a hundred dollars or a million dollars, whatever that is, we'll have some kind of a cash inflow and that'll show up, that'll show up on the cash flow statement. Now, remember back in that previous learning module, we talked about uh, whether or not intangible assets can be identified as having a limited lifespan under which they'll be amortized, or if they have uh, an infinite lifespan, then they're not subject to amortization. There's a really simple, but yet really good question at the end of this learning module. And by the way, the Institute is now I think there are 23 questions at the end of this module, and they are introducing the concept of a vignette. So when you get to these questions, they're really, really cool. You'll see a couple of paragraphs and maybe a financial statement. And then at the top, uh, you'll be told uh, the following relates to questions one through seven. And so you have to know everything inside of that vignette and then be able to refer back to it. And there's one question that that has a paragraph and it says something like, you know, there's goodwill, there's a patent that expires in 40 years, and there's a copyright that was sold two years ago or something like that. And the question is, uh, which one of these um, is going to be amortized? And the implied question is, which one has a limited lifespan? And they gave it away above when saying that one of those had a 40 year lifespan. You'll see that question uh, when you go over that. But I think that's the, what, how the Institute is going to present this to you on, on the exam.
Now remember in the inventory analysis uh, recording, we had this concept of uh, writing down inventory and then what happens if the inventory then regains uh, some of its value. Remember I gave you that example of Jim's motorcycle company. Well, the same thing holds true here. Read those two bullet points over there. Uh, under the U.S. GAAP, once uh, a long-term asset, including an intangible asset, has been subject to the impairment process, then it can't be reversed. Okay. However, under the international standboard, uh, standards, there is a recoverable amount. So this is a good thing to remember for both long-term intangible assets and inventory. At the end of this learning module, there's some good questions on how the impacts ratio. So let's go through these here. Um, what, what happens to return on assets? Um, so of course, ROA is going to decrease. So think about it this way. You know, suppose we have net income of 10, total assets of 100. So what is that? A 10% return on assets. But if we have some kind of an impairment or a, a derecognition, let's say it's worth, let's say it's five. So what happens to the denominator? The denominator goes from 100 down to 95. What happens to the numerator? Well, it's probably not going to go from, from 10 down to 5 because there are taxes and maybe some other things. But even if you do you know, 5 or 6 or 7 divided by 95, you still get, you still get less than the uh, you still get less than the 10%. So remember that one. Decreases due to reduced net income and assets. Uh, the asset turnover ratio, this is probably going to almost always increase because total assets decline. So you have revenues and then the smaller total asset goes into those revenues more times. Now, there are some instances where the sales may increase as well, but the Institute doesn't mention any of those kinds of things. So I would remember just probably an increase there. Profit margin, we've got an impairment loss that shows up on the left-hand side of the income statement. So that's going to decrease. And then debt to equity. Wow. So remember what we said in that earlier slide, that if we have a reduction in the value of the assets, then we have to have an, a relatively equal reduction over in equity, maybe some kind of impact in debt. So the debt to equity ratio is, uh, is probably going to increase, mostly because there's going to be a uh, much bigger reduction in the equity right-hand side of the balance sheet than the debt on the top right-hand side of the balance sheet. Now, I say this regularly. The Institute is super big on disclosure, and of course, uh, we should be as well. How do we disclose these things over on the balance sheet? We do the carrying value of the asset. So if we have a long-term asset, whether it's a physical asset or an intangible asset, we have you know the initial cost minus depreciation or depletion or amortization. So over on the income statement, then we're gonna look at those expenses, uh, depreciation, depletion, and amortization expense if, if they actually show up. Uh, statement of cash flows. This is when we acquire an asset or we dispose of an asset. So that'll show up on the investing section, but then those expenses, they'll show up in the operating section. And then, of course, we want to disclose as much as we can in the notes. We want to tell them what kind of accounting methods that we use, what depreciation, what is the useful life, what was that historical cost, accumulated depreciation, all that good stuff uh, that we have learned in the past. And then a good uh, analysis of financial statements wouldn't be complete unless we talked about a couple of financial ratios. So fixed asset turnover ratio. Uh, all we're doing is taking total revenue divided by, well, take the fixed assets from last year, take the fixed assets from this year, and then go ahead and take an average of them. So think about what we want here. We want to invest uh, as much as we possibly can in these fixed assets, and then we want to generate lots and lots of revenues. So we want, we want these ratios to be higher. And what that indicates is that, that it's a skill set that the executives can go ahead and take a look at the, let's say, the bottom left-hand side of the balance sheet and turn that into lots of top-hand, right-hand side of the income statement, right? We want to spend a dollar on an asset and generate $1,000 in revenue. And then there are a couple of questions at the end of this learning module on the age and remaining life. So there are just a couple of equations. You should probably memorize those things. Uh, 
as a good analyst, we want to know if uh, one of our assets is uh, ready to become obsolete whether we've been using it for 100 years, whether we've been using it for one year. So what is that average age? That gives us an indication of future capital expenditures. That's probably a really good exam question. Uh, investment property, uh, we can always, uh, as businesses go out and buy uh, an apartment building or a miniature golf course or whatever it is out there, so under the international standards, we're probably going to use uh, either the cost model or the fair value model. Uh, we've talked about those before, so that's uh, those are pretty self-explanatory under the international standards. But under the U.S. standards, there's really no specific definition of investment property. So a miniature golf course is probably considered to be identical as an apartment building. And that takes us through this, you know, relatively short. Uh, learning module. There are, I believe, 23 questions at the end of this learning module. I want you to go and take, you know, some of these you'll be able to get really, really quickly, but it'll probably take you 20 minutes to get through this. I want you to go do that right now. So thanks for watching. Uh, have a great day and good luck studying.